So welcome everybody. Um, I just wanted to do some quick introductions um, and then hand it over to Leila Farah who will be running this presentation. Um, so we're here for uh, Simon Gordon's uh, final thesis presentation, um, uh, Synanthropic Center. And uh, I'll start by introducing our two external guest critics. Uh, we have uh, Joyce Wang, assistant professor at SUNY Buffalo and director of Ants of the Prairie and Lola Shepard, uh, Associate Professor at the University of Waterloo and partner in Lateral Office. So thank you both so much for joining us. Um, the committee for Simon is uh, myself, Marco Polo as supervisor, uh, Terry Peters as second reader, and Leila Farah is the program rep and therefore will be running the, the, the review this afternoon. We're also joined by one of Simon's colleagues from practice, um, Anthony Frazina, who's also one of our alum. So hi, Anthony. Um, so anytime, uh, anytime you're ready, Leila. Hey, thank you very much, Marco. Uh, so welcome all, we're delighted to have you. Uh, and uh, we're uh, very pleased to hear Simon Gordon, uh, his final presentation uh, titled Into the Sin Anthropocene, the, re the, the Resynchronized Architecture of a Keystone Species. So you have about 20 minutes to present, and then we'll have time for um, questions, uh, hopefully two rounds of questions. Okay. Sure, sounds good. I'm just going to um, connect the presentation. Okay, can you all see it? That's right, yes, we can. Yes, okay. good, good to go. Okay, great. <clears throat> so uh, um, thank you for joining. I'm very glad to have uh, Lola and Joyce uh, come on as guests. And thank you to the committee and everyone else that's uh, joining in for my uh, final uh, thesis presentation. Um, this work is titled uh, Into the uh, Synanthropocene, um, uh, the Resynchronized uh, Architecture of a Keystone Species. Uh, I'll start by unpacking a few terms. Uh, the Anthropocene is a uh, popularized term uh, for an emerging geological age of the earth. It is a time period characterized by the environment's vulnerability uh, to the immense influence of human activity. Um, in the spirit of pursuing a counter narrative to this, I proposed a modification uh, of this term. The Synanthropocene would be an age where uh, human activity and interventions have a positive ecological uh, impact and promotes co a coexistence with other species. Uh, I based this term on a word that I encountered in my research, uh, a composite of the Greek word anthropos, meaning man, and the prefix sin, meaning with. Uh, a synanthrope is an undomesticated animal that benefits from associating with uh, a human environment. Finally, to uh, recognize that many animals are negatively impacted by artificial landscapes, I've also come up with the term antithrope. Uh, modern urban landscapes are a radically new type uh, of environment that has emerged very recently across the planet uh, from an evolutionary perspective. They are the product of the fast paced process of cultural evolution, uh, which can be said to be out of sync with the much slower process of biological evolution. The incentive for this thesis is to investigate how architecture can serve as a link that would resynchronize these two processes. It asks, how can the urban landscape be designed uh, to be more in sync with its surrounding wildlife? Uh, much of the uh, relationship between culture and nature throughout history has been that of antagonism, uh, but never so uh, pronounced as in recent times. Populations of thousands of different species worldwide have declined by more than 60% only within the span of the last five decades. The, oh, my bad. Uh, the, um, urban lands the urban landscape uh, poses dangers to wildlife in various ways. Uh, their senses are disoriented by the city's lights, sounds, and heavy traffic. Uh, streets and uh, buildings are hotbeds for collisions that perpetuate habitat fragmentation, uh, which uh, isolates entire populations of animals. While some do find shelter and food in the urban environment, uh, many animals are endangered by it. However, uh, since the city is a product of design, it is also a place where people can make a difference. There is a paradigm shift in contemporary architectural discourse with the emergence of terms like 
Habitecture, Biodiversity Sensitive Urban Design, and Synanthropic Architecture. They are part of a broader effort to re-envision architecture as being resynchronized with the environment. I've set out to explore the design of this hybrid environment and framed a number of key objectives. In the scope of this strategy, the safeguarding of human safety is paramount. This hierarchy uh, also elevates the needs of wildlife, uh, such as the requirement for a circulation network, as well as protected um, uh, and integrated habitats. Finally, uh, there is also a cultural dimension uh, that emerges from this symbiotic relationship. Opportunities uh, to create an immersive experience uh, that connects people with their surrounding biosphere. Um, despite, uh, uh, I've chosen um, Toronto as the site to explore this uh, design intervention. The city is actually situated on the edge of the Carolinian forest, a precious parcel of land with a unique climate made possible by the Great Lakes um, that has uh, the, the greatest concentration of biodiversity uh, in Canada. It hosts one third of the country's uh, endangered species. Uh, despite being um, heavily urbanized, uh, Toronto is dotted with an abundance of parks and green corridors that serve as the city's remaining bastions of natural habitat. After visiting and discovering the rich biodiversity in these various locations, I selected a number of creatures to focus on that would inform uh, this developing strategy. Uh, the animals that I selected were intended to act as broad representatives of a wider category of subjects with similar characteristics and behaviors. This particular selection, however, also consists of animals that each in their own way actually have a closer relationship to the urban environment. That being said, even with their greater level of adaptability, they still face tremendous challenges and uh, some are even endangered. A deeper uh, investigation of these specific animals developed into a series of design uh, interventions. The little brown bat, for example, ventures into human territory to hunt insects uh, near street lamps and bodies of water. They prefer to roost inside of tight and well-protected uh, crevices uh, wherever they're found. A, a specially designed uh, bat house might actually be a preferable option. Uh, after researching and uh, constructing this bat house prototype, which you can see uh, to your right there, um, I developed another, uh, uh, I also developed another uh, variation of a bat roost that can be integrated into a standard wood frame uh, construction system. Uh, moving the design of these interventions beyond the micro scale, I intended to develop an overall strategy that operates on a broader level. At the meso scale, uh, various nodes in the urban environment uh, would connect with each other and uh, nearby uh, natural habitat. These connections uh, form a greater network at the macro level that acts to strengthen the integrity of the overall urban ecosystem. Uh, one method for creating these connections uh, would be by repurposing parts of the city. Uh, various older neighborhoods in Toronto with back lanes uh, have reduced vehicle activity as uh, people increasingly rely on bicycles and public transit. These inactive zones can be repurposed more effectively as green corridors. Uh, the garage uh, structures in these uh, lanes could be rededicated as habitat uh, compartments. Rewilding entire uh, segments of the city that can have various biophilic benefits to the community from uh, proximity to natural scenery, uh, as well as benefits of carbon sequestration and um, reduced heat island effect. Another uh, central idea to my thesis is that it actually doesn't take much to have tremendous impact. While the raccoon is often thought of as highly adaptable, even this creature faces many challenges in a landscape where the tectonics don't cater to its behavioral activity. However, even just a slight alteration in architectural design 
can actually cascade into having a significant ecological utility. Having looked at the barn, barn owl, I researched uh, various requirements that uh, they have uh, to develop an adequate habitat design as well. Uh, for an animal whose very taxonomy suggests a strong relationship to the built environment, uh, it's surprising to discover that there are only five pairs remaining in Ontario. Uh, this is due to habitat loss and uh, the recent prevalence of bird-proof barns. Considering these various creatures, I uh, designed a dedicated structure for animal inhabitation. Emulating the conditions of a chimney shaft for uh, the raccoon, I developed an enclosed tower. Having a slight incline to the wall with a, stepped, uh, a stepping design uh, allows the raccoon to climb up um, uh, to the den. The tower then angles outwards uh, to prevent them from uh, reaching the bird's nest above. Following uh, the data for the minimum opening requirements uh, for these animals, each of their uh, respective doorways uh, protect against larger predators. This tower can be the first of many similar iterations that facilitate habitat for different creatures uh, in the city. The final challenge for this thesis is exploring architecture as a vehicle to develop a socio-ecological hub, a place where nature and culture intertwine. The Urban Ecopoiesis by Ko Hao Yu uh, was designed as a school in Singapore uh, with an environmentally focused agenda. Um, the, the building connects with local ecological systems and operates uh, outdoor educational activities. The Ford Calumet Environmental Center uh, promotes an ecological program through workshops and um, different training activities. These places uh, uh, create an immersive environment uh, that communicates a mutual relationship between uh, communities and their local ecology. The Bickford Center in Toronto was selected as an optimal site uh, for this type of intervention. It is situated in the Annex neighborhood uh, in between a string of parks uh, that run over top uh, the historic Garrison Creek that's buried underground. On one side, uh, the site meets the bustling activity of Bloor Street, and on the other, it consists of the quiet stillness of uh, Bigford Park that dips well below street level. This former uh, high school built in the 60s is now an adult learning center, although parts of it are unused and others are in great disrepair. Approaching um, from Bloor Street, a wide uh, set, um, set of uh, stairs uh, lead down towards a paved plaza and the green space. Uh, from there, uh, it is possible to either continue forward along an elevated catwalk that leads to the main entrance or uh, downwards along um, a, an adjacent set of stairs. The building has a theater accessible at this level uh, and a gym and a pool at the level below. Uh, above this floor, there is another block that consists of three levels of classroom space. The lower level uh, has an open throughway that connects the entry plaza on Bloor Street uh, with Bigford Park to the south. The building also forms an interior courtyard uh, at the center of this passage. In uh, seeking to design a synanthropic center, I've proposed several modifications to the building. The entrance uh, would be moved to a new addition that connects the building with Bloor Street. The old entry catwalk would be removed, uh, making room for a wider uh, redeveloped plaza space. The big block uh, at the south end would be entirely gutted uh, and built into a larger structure that uh, plays a central role in the overall scheme. The building also uh, integrates with the sloping landscape uh, to create various habitat environments, including um, a wetland that blends uh, into the park. The uh, facility uh, would adopt an ecologically focused program, <clears throat> promoting education about local biodiversity, 
through organized activities as well as an immersive architectural experience. The center would support a range of educational methodologies uh, using various classroom spaces, exhibition galleries, workshops, labs, uh, presentation hall, and a library. While some of these are more private, uh, visitors have a direct view into some of these areas from a central corridor that extends from the lobby. It continues through the exhibition hall uh, to a spiral stair that leads up to the space above where the focal point of the project takes place. Um, this central access uh, through the site informs the directionality of the project, both inside and out. This line is framed and amplified by the lobby addition that elongates this corridor, uh, which runs parallel to the adjacent underpass. This axial center line is meant to link the opposite sides of the site, both for people and animals. Uh, the facility acts as a node within a uh, continuous ecological system in the neighborhood. The rewilded lanes uh, nearby interconnect as a network that provides uninterrupted access to this locus of habitat. The building has multiple uh, wildlife circulation pathways. The lobby addition is fitted with an overhead crossing that extends over Bloor Street uh, to connect to Christie Pitts Park on the north. The redeveloped uh, green roof has places for animals to forage and uh, inhabit. The lobby uh, encloses a garden that dips below street level, creating a habitat uh, that animals can access from a crawl space underneath it. Uh, the large block to the south has uh, corridors for animals, as well as nesting sites in the pods that penetrate the facade. A number of obelisk structures are also uh, placed throughout uh, this hybrid um, landscape. The main space at the back of the building <clears throat> aims to achieve uh, an enclosed environment that is shared by both humans and wildlife, a heterogeneous space. Uh, inspired by the Amazon spheres in Seattle, uh, this space uh, cultivates a rich environment of natural growth. Animals can enter uh, the space from the outside through various vestibules and window openings. While the uh, bottom floor is given over entirely to animals, people can navigate this space using elevated walkways. Weather permitting, uh, animals are, ab uh, are able to permeate uh, through this space uh, day and night. Uh, in places uh, both low and high, animals can forage move about and uh, find nesting sites. This multi-story block is built as a large wood frame structure over top uh, the existing column grid, uh, which supports the various uh, natural and uh, natural elements and, and built structures within this uh, spacious uh, framework. The, uh, this study model uh, of the classroom pods illustrates the intent uh, for incorporating notches and grooves into their exterior walls. Uh, these indentations uh, provide habitat opportunities as well as a more tectonic surface for animals to climb. The elevated platforms meet the pod at the doorway but circle around uh, the rest of it uh, in order to create some distance between uh, humans and the animals uh, residing within these pockets. People moving uh, through these platforms can observe a host of uh, ecological activity, uh, be it uh, birds and butterflies uh, flying about, uh, mammals crawling and climbing, and all manner of creatures living in uh, the pockets of this space. The building integrates extensively with the park to the, uh, on the south side. Um, the existing pool is converted into a wetland that is fed by a waterfall of harvested water. This uh, helps to boost the local ecology as it provides animals with a lush water source. <clears throat> this stream uh, also acts uh, as a cultural artifact uh, that pays homage to the historic Garrison Creek uh, that's buried underneath. Uh, 
other various areas of the land with the landscape um, to provide access for animals uh, to move into the building. The uh, building envelope uh, is designed to um, uh, follow the parameters of bird-friendly uh, guidelines. Uh, the contour of the exterior wood uh, facade uh, undulates organically to contrast uh, the building's overall orthogonal uh, geometry. Cutouts through this facade uh, demarcate a void space where birds can enter when the operable windows are opened up. Um, the facade wraps around the building, but the wood slats a stop on the north side. <clears throat> Here from uh, Bloor Street, passersby can peer into uh, this hub of activity, seeing the blurry motion of vague shapes in behind the semi-transparent uh, glass. This street-facing side uh, with solid pods penetrating through the glazing is a kind of polar opposite uh, to the park facing side that has voids in the facade. After having a glimpse into the building's inner workings, uh, curious visitors can uh, walk, uh, the walk through, uh, will come across an internal courtyard, uh, which serves as a kind of laboratory. Uh, here, uh, habitat designs that have been built in the adjacent workshop space uh, would be tested and displayed. Uh, should they choose to explore further and enter the building within, uh, the facility provides a range of educational activities and an immersive environment uh, bustling with ecological activity. It supports a program where people are not only observers, uh, but learn how to be active participants in their own biosphere. In the wake of an emerging paradigm shift, the Synanthropic Center celebrates the relationship between communities and their surrounding biodiversity. It produces a hybrid architectural framework that creates synergy between culture and nature. It is part of a greater effort to re-envision society's place within its biome, uh, to reimagine humanity as a keystone species and to carry it forward into the Sin Anthropocene. Finally, I'd like to end with a quick reflection that relates to our current predicament, uh, which has developed worldwide. The onset of COVID-19 has forced us into a lockdown and will undoubtedly have an impact on how we approach architectural design. It has also revealed the extent of biodiversity that has been living in the margins of our cities. Rather than returning to a future where animals continue to be pushed back, what if there is another way? Perhaps urban environments can be designed with an alternative strategy that considers wildlife and genuinely integrates them uh, into what would be a shared synanthropic uh, landscape. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Simon. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, if uh, there's any uh, question for clarification, uh, maybe that would be uh, uh, the time now to ask and uh, then if not, uh, then we can uh, start with our guests, uh, either Joyce or Lola, uh, to start commenting and providing feedback. But first, if there's a point of clarification. Yeah. Um, oh, good. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Lola. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. No, my, my point, my question for clarification is just, I'm wondering if you could go back to something like an overall axon of the project and sure. just sort of point out what all the spaces are because you sort of did the axon and then there's all these kind of, you know, great renderings of, scenarios, but if you could just sort of say within the overall context where those spaces are. Um, and, and maybe related to that is, I, I didn't quite catch, like what is the, you must have said this, I just somehow missed this, like what is the program of the building? Like who, is this like a kind of urban zoo? Is it a, a research center? Uh, yeah, I just, I, I didn't catch what's happening inside the building beyond the species. Sure. Um, so the building is is a, is a kind of a um, uh, it, it's it's intended to to be kind of a um, in, informed by by a changing paradigm and it, and it's meant to um, to to help uh, people understand uh, the 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 reality of the 
uh, socio-ecological tensions uh, in the urban environment. So it's it's meant to uh, help help people well, uh, teach people about uh, their their local ecosystems and the, the wildlife in, in the area, and learn uh, ways in which uh, they can themselves um, have an impact. So uh, by participating in in some actual like uh, uh, building workshops where they actually build um, uh, various habitat structures that they can like take home with them um, and, and things like that. So it's part of a, a shift in, in the zeitgeist of the culture. And, and this place is meant to, um, to, to help that, that shift along. And it's kind of like the, the, uh, the catalyst for it. So it, it helps uh, people um, uh, learn how to uh, uh, respond better to uh, to the surrounding wildlife mm -hmm. and what they can do to help. So in terms of the program itself, I mean, um, it, it's, I've put in uh, different ideas. Um, it's maybe not totally fixed in stone, but it, it's meant to uh, do two things. First of all, <clears throat> uh, this hybrid architectural environment is a place where they, they can actually uh, come in and, 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 and see animals that, that would be around uh, of their own uh, uh, free will, of their own, of their own accord. So it's not um, bringing animals on purpose. So it's not acting like a zoo, uh, but it's part of this idea of what if architecture uh, was intertwined more with um, the surrounding ecology and, and by providing access and providing opportunity, uh, animals would be drawn in. And because of that, having that um, real life experience of seeing animals around, people might shed different misconceptions about animals and, uh, and fears, and, and they can actually uh, see what, what these animals are like if they're around. Um, and then, so, so that, that's, the, that's one way, that's the actual experience. The other one is just educational programs like um, uh, the workshops, uh, the, the design workshop of different habitats, uh, various classrooms, um, the, the theater turns into a kind of presentation space. Um, uh, there's also perhaps a, a laboratory and there's kind of this uh, uh, program of kind of um, that, that teaches about uh, environmental um, uh, dynamics and kind of skill sets related to um, um, environmental related issues. Um, finally, there's actually also an animal hospital kind of integrated into there, but it's a, a secluded portion of the, of the building campus. And it's kind of an extension. Uh, it was in my mind, an extension of the Toronto Wildlife Center, which responds to um, uh, all the, uh, um, all, all the calls of different animals being uh, uh, finding challenges in the city and being maimed by, by them. So this is kind of a, a, a second branch of that to kind of help that along. So I don't know if that answers the question. It's kind of a very uh, long answer, but. If that answers the question, I would invite uh, Joyce or Lola to start uh, commenting, providing feedback or. I guess uh, maybe just to kind of maybe respond a bit to also what Lola's question might be playing is I wonder if um because I, I I I definitely applaud your your thesis and your um kind of the exuberance of including animals within the kind of built environment and and to provide all these kind of um really kind of amazing experiences that you're showing in the project so it's a it's a great can you actually can you go back to the uh, axon I wanted to actually kind of talk to this a little bit um so I think um, when Lola is asking, you know, what exactly is this? I think one of the things that might be helpful would be for you to maybe sort of invent a name or to invent, um, in a way it's sort of like a, a demonstration center kind of um, lab slash education centers. There's like a whole bunch of program that you're bringing together to try to kind of, um, you know, to try to, to bring together all these kind of experiences for, for, um, for, you know, for living within a kind of synanthropic world. 
and um, bringing that that experience to bear to you know to the kind of inhabitants and to the visitors and so on. And I think trying to find a way to kind of um, frame that as a as a as a program. So in the way that a zoo is a construction, is like your thing is a new thing that that. Um, kind of needs like a some kind of title um, that goes beyond just your sorry I've got to turn off my phone here um, that goes beyond your thesis title you know is it a new kind of institution is it a new kind of learning center um, and then I guess in that sense like I was when I was looking at this act um, what, I, what I was trying to understand is when you're showing all of your spaces I was actually trying to understand where are all the frictions if there are any in this project between humans and animals like or are all the spaces going to be you know heterogeneous and you get to experience everything everywhere or are there going to be some spaces where the frictions are present and how might you delineate those more sure um just to speak on the frictions i mean the, the blending occurs uh, can you see my mouse yep the blending occurs um uh, mostly almost exclusively here uh, in terms of it being in an interior environment. So it's just in this uh, large volume. Um, there could be uh, some interactivity on the outside, perhaps through the main axis, um, because animals can uh, walk uh, to different gardens and different parts of the landscape kind of surrounding the building. Uh, but the rest of the interior uh, is, uh, supposed to be kind of closed off to just people, um, except for wherever uh, animals are brought in under kind of a greater degree of control, um, perhaps in a presentation or in the hospital. Um, there was something else I wanted to say. I forget. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I had a kind of very similar um, in a way, question uh, as as Joyce. Um, I mean, I'm also, you know, find the topic really interesting. Um, the site is actually interesting, um, but it does feel like in in all your discussion, there's and this is I find happens a lot in theses. This sort of like, thou shall cohabitate, and it shall all be happy and peaceful and um, and I do, you know, I, I'm thinking of sometime last year, uh, I walked into my office at Waterloo and there was some horrible stench and um, no one's ever figured out what it was, but it, it smelled like an animal had died. Right. Um, and I can actually, no, sorry. Well, two, one was a stench and then one day I walked in and there was a dead mouse in my office and I literally jumped out and shrieked and I didn't re-enter my office for about a week. And so this is some, now I'm not as maybe um, attuned with nature as Joyce is, but I, I think this assumption that, I think this question of friction is crucial, right? We know that we even, you know, whenever I hear a raccoon in my front garbage, you know, my daughter goes out with a sort of a broom and like shrieks. And so it, it isn't an easy cohabitation. And in some ways I found the earlier studies about you know, calibrations to building envelope, to bricks, to something sort of spoke to the idea that that an interface could design the cohabitation and perhaps recognize that, you know, interior spaces really remain interior. And then, but how can a species occupy the roof or the underbelly or the walls or the dormers or the... And so in some ways your, your space of cohabitation I'm more interested in like the landscapes and how the building might offer new views of these new wetlands and so forth. Cause I find the space where you're talking about the actual cohabitation, it risks feeling like a zoo. And if we go back to your primary question, which was how can an urban landscape be more in sync? I don't know that this is a replicable role model, right? I mean, which maybe begs the question of should you have looked at something that's more systemic that can be deployed, you know, on every new condo or every new mid rise or all our malls or whatever. But I, I, I completely get the idea of the demonstration project, but I, I guess, I guess I wonder like in this heterogeneous space, what is replicable? You know, what could, could we have that in the atriums of our, office towers, could we, you know, could we have it in the atrium of the Waterloo School of Architecture or the Buffalo entrance school of architecture? You know, I, I guess like 
what works systemically and and is reproducible and what is kind of highly specific to this institution? It's mm -hmm. a good question. <clears throat> and um, I've, I've, I've come across this question kind of I think previously as well. Um, so th there's a question about uh, replicability and then um, and there was something else I wanted to, to point out. So um, oh yeah, the, the, the network. Okay, so if I can just quickly, uh, well, I would like to just quickly uh, pull to my uh, thesis document where uh, we talked about uh, a phased approach to this uh, uh, re-envision, re-envisioning and redesigning uh, the urban environment. So it, it's very. This is uh, th this space represents kind of the pinnacle of like the most tense way to combine uh, uh, people and animals. Um, uh, in the thesis document, I talked about kind of a uh, phased approach uh, where um, we, we kind of uh, mer um, merge the boundaries between uh, people and animals uh, closer and closer kind of in a very gradual way. So, so this would be kind of the extreme end of that. And so so in, in this thesis project, I tried to test out what that extreme might be like, but um, in the thesis document, I'll just pull page uh, da, 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 85. Um, excuse me. So I, I, I talked about how th there's different levels of um, kind of interactivity between th these opposing groups, and they can come in closer and closer until it's finally blended. And so um, th this thesis. Um, uh, assumes that the the culture has kind of reached that point, and it's it's supposed to kind of be a uh, this center is supposed to act as a catalyst in a in a node uh, of of the system. So, um, mm -hmm. pull up another image here. Excuse me. Um, here we go. So. They are supposed to be different um, kind of nodes that provide habitat and, and different connections. And then one of these nodes can be a kind of a major node that bring, that connects animals, but also um, intersects with a, a human network or, or a cultural network. So this is kind of that um, uh, focal point. So in terms of the reproducibility, um, so there. I think there are other kind of uh, designs that can be kind of mi micro interventions that can be ad adhered onto um, exterior walls of buildings and, and things like that. Um, th this project kind of represents an idea uh, kind of that extreme idea of kind of uh, letting animals in. So actually at, at Ryerson, we do have birds coming in to the atrium every now and then. This is kind of a more intense version of that that kind of follows um, the um, Amazon um, uh, spheres example, where here they have uh, an abundance of vegetation throughout this uh, large space. Um, they don't have any animals, they have like some frogs and, and, and puddles and stuff, but um, this project is really trying to see what would it be like if things did get to the point where we, we are gradually more okay with animals and uh, we kind of bring them in. Obviously, this is a very intense environment, and you know th there might need be like there might need to be like a maintenance crew and 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 things like that. So there's a lot of tensions that need to be considered um, in trying to pursue something like this. Right. I think. I mean, I feel like you really could. Um, you know, it, I I can definitely see this happening if there's maybe some uh, focus on maybe precise locations where you might make. Um, uh, a very precise shift. So I guess the the reason I was like looking at the axon was also to try to figure out, you know, it, you know, what's the boundary between this heterogeneous space and the space adjacent to it, which I think is like classrooms or something. It's, I think it was the educational thing that's next to it in the middle, right? Like, what's the boundary between this type of space and a space where animals are not allowed, and what does that boundary look like? Or if there's a, maybe a sectional condition, like when you have all these kind of animals hanging. Um, you know, um, climbing all over a raccoon on the wall, what is happening below in case to, you know, to receive the, 
the um, the droppings or to receive like is there is there some sectional relationship between you know the ability for animals to kind of be in certain places and what's below you know right. could that be a, a replicable um you know, say kind of sectional condition which is why i find your tower really interesting for that reason the the first tower that you showed um because it, it's something where the form of it is completely dependent on the kind of uh, strategy for predators you know to keep predators away from the top and sure, it seems sure. like it's a unified tower, but it has a sectional condition where you can understand the raccoon climbing into the bottom part and the owl in the top part. And that even though it looks like it's a continuous thing, it's actually not. And, um, you know, and that, uh, or is it? No, no, yeah, it's not. So it's, so there's like a sectional relationship and then the, the section of, of the top has to do with keeping predators away from the top, you know? So there's like a very kind of precise reason like why the section is the way it is. And I, I think that's something that I'm sort of looking for a little bit in, in the way that you're thinking about the bigger picture and not the bigger picture, but the larger in the building and your, your new program, your new center. <laughs> um, oh yeah, that's a fair point. And over here, like I, I really kind of delved into the details and try to figure out exactly um, how the animals would interact with the different parts of, of this um, uh, artifact and, and this was a really interesting uh, exercise to to develop. Um, I think the, the issue perhaps with the center is that I didn't bring it to a, 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 a higher level of resolution with that with this kind of uh, detail. Um, in, but in terms of like se sectionality, uh, Th that, that space is kind of the only space where, where they can go into from different kind of uh, entry points on, on the in the membrane. Um, they can't, they're not supposed to be able to move anywhere else into the building. So uh, if you look at this view, for, for example, this spiral stair, which uh, kind of corkscrews down into the building is kind of enclosed off. Um, so supposedly people can circulate into here and then come out into this an enclosed micro environment, I guess, and um, and the and the, po and the classroom pods are are also meant to be kind of closed off from animals, but the, the rest of the space is kind of interstitial and kind of allows uh, uh, animals to, to move around. But you, you make a you make a fair point about kind of figuring out the details further, um, and uh, you know part part of the um, um, incentive to try to deal with those kind of things is was giving the um, the bottom floor of this space entirely over to animals. So that's kind of like the beginnings of a strategy that deals with those kind of issues. Um, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps the walkways can uh, kind of have gaps in them and things. So, so there, there's definitely kind of more development that could be uh, done to uh, figure this out uh, in greater detail. I could uh, mention uh, something right now. Hi. Uh, do you mind if we uh, finish? No problem. The round? Go ahead. And, yeah, I just said. But we'd love to have your comments. But um, let's, if you don't mind, uh, we'll finish with the committee. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, go ahead. No, uh, Lola, if you want to uh, to to um, go ahead. I was just going to ask one other question on a on a very different front. Um, uh, I know this building well. I walk past it every day because my office is about. 50 feet from it okay. um, and I'm, I'm sure it's a great building it's um, like one of these rare remnants of um, 1960s or I was checking when it was built but in 60s or 70s modernism in Toronto with a pretty unique um, sectional and site relationship and I'm curious um, I know this is not the crux of the project but you chose this site and it is a provocative build I mean it's a provocative site in a provocative building. Um, can you speak a little bit to how you interface with the, the existing building? Because your project's pretty pretty heavy um, and, and sort of, um, yeah, I'm just curious how you, how you view the existing building and how you interface with it. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean exactly um, by well, for instance, in this photo, Joyce, I don't know if you know this building, but this, this um, so it's a building that sort of bridges two parks, Bloor, um, which is, you know, the main street in Toronto, yeah. um, bisects these two parks, uh, which, and you actually see it in that plan on the, 
<laughs> sorry, right corner. Um, so there's a big Christie Pitts Park and then this smaller Bickford Park, yeah. um, which has like a dog dog park and they play baseball and then whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and so this building is a bit of a bridge and that white bridge building is, is pretty powerful as a move because you actually slide under the, the white bridge. But then you go and build your own bigger bridge. And I guess I'm curious, like, for instance, the decisions to step down, like, as versus building a kind of second bridge building that might be a kind of parallel or mirror to the existing building, or even like you've chosen this sort of very heavy timber frame, whereas this is a kind of white concrete sort of high modernist um, expression. Like th there's so many choices where um, you're clearly taking a, a radically different stand, um, but I don't know how much is deliberate and how much is just like, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna do my thing. So I get, I'm curious if you could, from a kind of almost, I don't want to say preservationist, but um. yeah, uh, definitely. There's this site is really unique, um, and there's aspects to it that uh, I wanted to uh, maintain and kind of amplify, and others. Um, and so, um, for example, like this this access, this pathway that goes underneath, uh, I kind of kept that, and then uh, this block. Um, um, I found that the kind of floor to ceiling height here, uh, maybe perhaps because it's a relic from kind of older um, designs, like it is very low. And so I, I took the opportunity to just kind of redevelop this into something larger and grand and kind of amplify that, you know, that, that white uh, uh, bridge as you call it. Um, and then also I th did actually find that the this chimney, I kind of thought it would be interesting to uh, keep that as kind of a landmark in this uh, unique site. So um, that's why, I, even though I do increase the height of this, I ensure to kind of st step down so that, um, what's a good, where's a good image? So you're building behind it, right? I I'm building over top. I I'm replacing it. I I'm, I'm gutting that. I see. Thing. The back, wait, right, the back portion that faces Bigford. Right. Yeah. So, so just to clarify, like this space is replacing that white, the white uh, long, long bridge block, basically. Uh, and then the idea of the stepping came from uh, many iterations of trying to uh, give this a, a bit of a, uh, like a, a, a formal kind of characteristic of a kind of a, a landscape um, form, basically. Um, and then uh, it's also divided into like these three uh, sections uh, and the central one uh, acts as a kind of more open atrium inside that space. Uh, well, these ones with uh, with uh, a column grid that's more uh, cl closer together uh, supports these classroom pods on this side and one on, on this side as well. And then the, the, the chimney, um, I thought uh, maybe these obelisks kind of help to echo it. And there's this, there's these um, geometrical tensions in the side of, of uh, vertical members, horizontal members, and kind of organic um, undulating ones. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Harry, would you like to uh, provide some feedback and comments? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, when you were speaking and discussing through the project and this idea of animals existing and coming through the space, you had a note mentioning, you know, when the operable windows are open, right, birds can come in. And it's like, what's the thought process there of, of restricting versus giving, you know, animals the ability to enter or not? Like in the idea of coexistence of species, wouldn't one assume that, you know, this is completely porous on both the human and animal interaction? Yeah. Uh, so it's a good point. I mean, I've, I've definitely tackled that and, and I had another iteration of this where this was more open um, and th this space wasn't actually enclosed uh, with, with glazing and kind of allow um, year round uh, accessibility. Uh, the thing is, I mean, I admit that we are in Canadian climate and I have to deal with the winter. So I am enclosing it um, and kind of closing off 
windows and, and things of that, of that sort. Uh, however, I do, I did kind of try to come up with a kind of a, uh, a detail for a kind of vestibules uh, where it maintains the kind of um, uh, the, the, the thermal boundary, but allows animals to pass through. And I do have a sketch in the appendix of what that would have, what that looks like. So uh, these kind of vestibules, I kind of thought of a system of like allowing animals to kind of yeah. enter through and kind of immediate, immediately kind of slide down so they don't get stuck in there and uh, kind of loop back around. But um, it's definitely, it, it, it's really just a, a question of, you know, how do you deal with winter? Another option was to actually, you know, leave it open just like um, uh, Habitat 67 in Montreal, like the, those, those um, uh, residences are enclosed, but the, their kind of circular corridors are open mm -hmm. to the environment. And they just have a kind of a wind block. So I definitely kind of played around with these two and this is well, just ended up settling on. It seems like a, you know, great hibernation location for a lot of these animals that otherwise choose chimneys or, you know, bury under buildings. It's, a, it's an option that, you know, it it's almost over glorifies in the winter time because it becomes this hub for, you know, hibernation activity of animals that then, you know, spill out into the city and live their lives in the summer. Well, that's a fair point. And yeah. I think, you know, this kind of, um, uh, development requires collaboration with people in different fields, um, mm -hmm. kind of, uh, like experts that kind of understand kind of the, the patterns, uh, ecological patterns of animals and yeah. needs for hibernation, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. Terry Peters, would you have any comment or uh, feedback? Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, Simon, uh, for the presentation. Um, it was, it struck me while you were presenting and in this discussion, we've talked a lot about like sharing physical space with animals like you've shown here. But earlier on in your project, you were thinking about uh, sharing space in terms of time, like that there would be, you know, how much, how much do we need to interact with animals given that a lot of these animals might want to be out at night when maybe you're not having an educational event at the uh, at the, the place that this is, this, uh, this new uh, educational demonstration project idea. So thinking about how we share space in different or share time with animals in a space, maybe it's at night or different seasons. I think that's been picked up on. Like we have different in re in resyncing us with nature and nature with us. There's also this idea that they have their own um, sort of yeah, their timing and their uh, circadian patterns are different than ours. So how did you think about that in the resulting, in the, the final proposal? What would this be like at night? Well, exactly. I mean, this is why I went to this slide because um, I totally admit that, um, you know, they do have different patterns and a lot of the, these animals are nocturnal. Um, uh, so there, this space would actually see a lot of activity uh, during the night, I imagine. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I, th I think definitely need to kind of consider uh, how animals kind of uh, migrate throughout the year, uh, what their kind of uh, uh, reproduction uh, time periods uh, are. And, and kind of the more you, you go into this, the more you develop this, um, the more informed um, the design becomes in terms of Maybe some places can be occupied by some animals at a certain time and then others uh, at, a, at a later uh, date. So um, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marco, would you like to uh, make some comments? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon. And thanks everyone for the comments so far. Uh, it's a good discussion. Um, I, I just wanted to come back to this question of friction because I think that some, that is something we've talked about throughout the project and we've taken it, uh, you know, further even than what was talked about here in terms of, you know, the unpleasant encounters with dead mice and so forth. It's, you know, things like disease are an issue. Like certainly it's been talked about recently 
Um, we don't know exactly what's gone on with this virus, but there's obviously a lot of discussion about it coming from, uh, you know, the, the wet markets and so forth. Um, and there's always been a kind of tension between, uh, you know, protecting ourselves from um, uh, diseases that are born by animals and so forth. So definitely these, these areas of friction are, are really essential. Um, so I think on the one hand, the project um, has kind of two, two different kind of identities in a sense. One which is quite pragmatic in the idea that, you know, there is this kind of um, uh, paradigm shift, that there is an awareness that we live in this complex uh, ecosystem, that we have to make room for other, um, other uh, what did you call them, brain carriers at one point? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, the idea that there are uh, kind of practical issues associated with that. And I think the, the example of the obelisk is an interesting one because it addresses some very specific and particular issues related to specific species. The other identity of the project is very utopian. Um, and it assumes a kind of, of um, I, I think, idealized uh, relationship between all the, the various species. And I think that it's, a, it's an interesting kind of tension in itself, that kind of uh, the tension between the utopian and the pragmatic, which I think this project has a foot in both of those worlds. Um, and I think that's interesting because in, in a way, you know, I think many of us have long maintained that the utopian projects are the ones that, you know, really kind of try to advance our thinking about architecture and how we can do things differently through architecture and so forth. So I think that the utopian side of the project is an important side of it. Um, at the same time, it does it does tend to assume away some of these other issues that were certainly there through the process of the thesis, but are not necessarily um, uh, embodied in the in the in the current version of it. So, for example, the, the biggest one being this issue of, of disease, right. and you know what happens when you have rabid raccoons and all those kinds of things. So, so there there there's a lot of complexity to this, right? Um, I think it's been a really fascinating. Uh, a thesis for me to to uh, have followed through because I've learned an awful lot about things I knew very little about. Um, you know, I knew uh, some of what you're talking about, but I haven't had a very direct experience of it. And so it's been a really interesting um, uh, kind of process of, of understanding better, not only, you know, who we are sharing this environment with, but how they live in it and how they adapt. Some of these animals we've talked about need need very little assistance. They seem to be doing very well <laughs> on their own. Um, others obviously are much more challenged. And so there was, you know, obviously also this interesting discussion about what's, what species do you design for? Do you become species specific or are you more yeah. inclusive? Um, so obviously when you're dealing with something like uh, barn owl, which as you tell us have been reduced to only five uh, pairs in all of Ontario, and then you look at raccoons, skunks, and squirrels. Well, th those are different universes, right? Um, so, so I think that's also that that becomes another interesting question: is how targeted does this become, um, or or does it become a kind of catch-all that uh, that that doesn't discriminate in a sense, right? Um, I think the choice of site is a really important one. <clears throat> excuse me, and I think that it the the complexities of dealing with the the building aside the integration of something like this into the the creek system, the Berry Creek system and the ravine system of the city is a really interesting way to approach this uh, because it's kind of, uh, it, in some sense, it's almost a ready-made, right? Like we know that it's in the ravine systems that we have most of our wildlife, not necessarily these ravines that are very urban, but the ones more at the periphery of the city. Uh, but I think that what we're seeing through this this lockdown is that with very little uh, very little change, we start to see the, the emergence of this other life. And if, if we were able to um, relax our control over the environment, <laughs> um, that, that you know, we would see a lot more of this kind of activity in the city. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll leave it there for now. I'll let someone Thank else you very chime much. in. Uh, so thank you very much, Simon, for your presentation. Uh, so I, I very much agree that the health concerns to a human or humans' concerns to animals uh, could be um, continue to be articulated. I think it's really important, especially in our context. And when we, I really appreciate that you have reflecting on COVID at the end. Maybe that's an area where it could be uh, also 
um, uh, discussed. Um, uh, overall, the research I think is quite strong, the, the, the writing and uh, your uh, background research, uh, but it, re it would be really interesting to uh, really clarify uh, the existing and the additions. So is there a way to represent uh, these, uh, the additions that you have done so that uh, these uh, questions are uh, clearly uh, addressed? Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that the, the question of what is it exactly? Is it an observatory? Is it uh, a place to heal? Is it a place for uh, all of these um, uh, endangered species or not? Uh, which ones and what is their uh, food chains? And uh, are we putting together uh, some that probably uh, would be challenging to have together? So I think that would be uh, quite interesting. So we have a, a very little time for maybe one more comment from Lola if you have, or from Joyce. If you wish, if not, uh, we can wrap up. No, um, I mean, I think it's a, it's a super um, interesting and, and continues to be a relevant question. Um, I think, uh, for me, the, the th I think is you, if you pursue this in any form, you know, through professional work, I, I think there's a kind of level of precision on, on so many levels of like tectonic precision, species human interface precision, which, which species, which plants even I was, you know, as I get your axo and we see the sort of standard green, you know, form uh, whatever sketch up green and you know immediately there's a question of like well what what's being planted up there what and then I think it goes to Margaret's question of what so I think this I mean I think that as designers where we we have a, a, a potential to contribute when we get specific and when we, we you know dig down I feel like in a way there's like eight theses within the thesis and so it would be interesting to take one aspect of it and really um, push it and you know maybe you write submit it for an article or something like I think the thesis has a, a lot of potential for um, continued breadth and investigation. Thank you very much. Uh, Joyce any last comment? Yeah well I, I, I just want to say congratulations on a wonderful thesis project. Um, I Your research is really uh, quite thorough and quite good. I was just scrolling through your uh, PDF document before earlier today, and it's there's a lot there that I think perhaps um, you know in the presentation it's hard to cover everything that you have done. I I feel that your um, you know the it's not so much a, about details so much as at least for me a kind of conceptual clarity in how uh, how you've developed that first prototype, the tower prototype that I think has um, has potential impacts in the way that we think about um, other relationships. So it's fascinating, for example, that you in that in that one prototype that you have a, you know, you have a species that is kind of running rampant all over Toronto, you know, the raccoon, and in the same structure, you have the species that's almost extinct or that is, you know, endangered. And that there you're housing them within the same structure and there's a kind of seamlessness to the, to the appearance, but that there's a division and a kind of safety, safety um, uh, measure for how they won't intersect so that you don't have raccoons killing owls or whatever, right? So although that probably would probably be more like owl killing the raccoon, <laughs> um, but in any event, you don't have, you know, so you're, so there's a very kind of precise, not just, it's not just about the detailing, but it's about the kind of conceptual clarity of putting these two species together. And I think, and I, I don't think that your, um, I think that your, your larger proposal for the, for the kind of new center is fascinating, but I do think that if you, in terms of what Lola's saying, like developing kind of, you know, an idea for, you know, maybe to kind of put something forward into like a publication or proposals for somewhere else. I think you could take moments within that, develop them to this level of clarity. And that could be a way to move forward. I think it's, there's so many great ideas in this that, you know, it's a very rich thesis. And I think there's a lot of possibilities for, for development of any of these kind of these situations. Oh, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So thank you very, very much, uh, Simon. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you to our external guest reviewers, Joyce Huang from um, Sunny Buffalo and Lola Shepard from the University of Waterloo. Uh, thank you also uh, to the committee. So Marco Polo, uh, the supervisor, second reader, Terry Peters. So this concludes the presentation.
Uh, thank you for the guests who have uh, uh, um, joined us uh, online and for Tone for joining us here. Uh, so this concludes the presentation and uh, we will deliberate. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to say, uh, I think this was really good feedback and uh, um, thank you really for uh, coming on. It's, it's, it's really great to have you in the discussion. So I really appreciate it. So thank you. And so uh, Simon, I will, I will contact you once we've finished our deliberation. Sure. So wait for my uh, my email invitation to that'll be a separate Zoom meeting. Yeah. Um, so if you can leave us now, and Tony, if you can leave us now, we will go. Do in we, camera, we leave also, say. right? No, no, you remain. Oh, we, Guests, oh, please, sorry, okay. please remain.